It's Sunday night, and we're in a discussion on the doctrine of the devil. The doctrine of the devil is delusion. Let me write that down. Doctrine of the devil is delusion. Of course, the Bible says in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith and they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And devil is the word daemonion. And daemonion comes from the root dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. Now, distribute fortunes does not just mean money. It can be your opinion. It can be things or stuff, or it can be awards, or it can be lifting you up where you feel good about yourself. Now, I've read to you the word delude. I'm going to put it on the board again. The word delusion uh, is a word that means to fool by false promises or wrong notions. Now, Kenneth Copeland preaches the doctrine of the devil, and all those charismatics, they have fooled you into believing if you follow those people. We don't follow them here. But anyone who follows them, they have fooled people into believing that if you give them your money, then you will get rich. And I've never met anyone that gave their money to Kenneth Copeland that got lots of money in return. It means to mislead or deceive by trickery. Now, it means to to elude or to frustrate somebody. Delusion implies belief in something that is contrary to fact or reality. It's not a fact that you give your money to all these people. It's not a fact if you give your money to them, you're going to make lots of money. That's just not true. God never promised that. What's so funny is they will tell you if you send your money to them, you will make lots of money, but they don't tell you if you send your money to a Baptist church or to a Presbyterian church or to a to a church of Christ, you'll make lots of money. It's only if you send it to them. That's a very deluding factor. Uh, resulting from deception, a misconception or of a or a mental disorder. Now, the word delusion uh, means deluding or being deluded, a false belief or opinion. It's all false. It's amazing to me how people will say when they first hear this message, those that believe it, they will say, I, I did not realize I had to suffer tribulation and trial. I never hear preachers, I don't care who they are, I don't care what preacher it is, Billy Graham, Charles Stanley, uh, David Jeremiah, uh, all these Baptists, I never hear them uh, say anything about a daily cross, self-denial, suffering for righteousness' sake, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. I've never heard any of them quote that. I've never heard any of them quote Second Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I've never heard one of them uh, quote the verse out of the third chapter of Second Thessalonians. I believe it's verse 3, where the scripture says, No man should be moved by these afflictions, knowing that you were appointed there too. You're appointed to affliction. Now, that's the truth. And we are to stay away from that doctrine. Let me read to you the word beguile. Now, these I have put these words on the board. We have already studied the words plane and plane's derivations. Plane is one of the words that's been translated deceive, or deception. Well, my pens aren't doing very good. Y'all excuse me a minute. I'm going to have to throw them away and get me a... Hold on a second here. Now, we've already studied these words, plane, 
Planeo. Planas. And Planetes. These are common words that have been translated deceive, deception, or to beguile, or filled with guile. And you have many other words that would be that would be uh, synonymous with these words. The word guile in the Greek is the word dolos. It means to to use trickery to deceive someone. It's something you use in words to cause men to believe something's happening that's not happening. We've gone through these words here. Now we're going through the words apate, apatao, and ex apatao. It means delusion or deceit, to cheat or to beguile, seduce completely. That's what the word ex apatao means. It means someone who has been so so deceived that you cannot hardly get them out of it. That ex apatao. It's a form of apatao. Let me read to you the word beguile. Beguile means to mislead by cheating, tricking, or deceiving. To deprive of or out of something by deceit. To cheat. To pass time pleasantly while away. To charm or to delight. Now, the reason somebody charms you is not for your good. When the girl walks in the door and she's six, she's nearly six foot tall and she's got a beautiful figure and a beautiful body and a beautiful face, she is beguiling and enchanting. She's enchanting. And most people don't realize, most people don't realize that before... She learned to dress up fancy. She was a stringy little girl at home and thinking she's never going to become anything. And all of a sudden, somebody dressed her up one day and she found out a way to enchant or trick people into thinking she wasn't somebody's big sister who used to get mad at her little brother and say, Mama, Johnny ate the last cookie out of the cookie jar and that was mine. And all of those fancy uptown people, at one time, Cindy Crawford was one of those girls. She wasn't what she looks like on the TV and in the movies. She's somebody's big sister or somebody's little sister. They said, they told her, you're too stringy, you'll never do anything with your life until she found out she could model and fool people. It always reminds me of the serpent was more subtle. Enchant is not a good word. Enchant always get. It makes us think of fairy tales, doesn't it? Where the serpent or the witch or the witch of the north or the west or whoever she was would enchant someone to go into the into the gingerbread house so she could put them in a pot and boil them and eat them. Well, that's enchanting. Enchant never has and innocence to it never does it enchanting is not reality it's fairy tales of course fairy tales are demon tales all the fairy tales come out of the ancient world and out of demon worship and the word serpent in genesis 3 and 1 the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field and serpent is the word nakash and it comes from a word that's spelled exactly the same way, which means to enchant. And that's and when you enchant someone, that's what Kenneth Copeland and Fred Price and Creflo Dollar and T D Jakes are enchanting you. When when you watch T D Jakes and he's going, Come on, come on, how you don't know what I'm talking about. Do you and they're going, Whoa and jumping up and down. That's an enchanting method. That's all it is. There's no reality in it. I am very, very put out by motivational speakers. I don't believe them. Don't believe Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar had a saying. 
Zig Ziglar was big, super motivational speaker in the 60s and 70s. He's probably dead now. I hope he is. Now, Zig Ziglar said, he had a saying, the one who dies with the most toys wins. And I had a T-shirt made, and I gave it to Dave, I believe, didn't I? It says, the one who dies with the most toys goes to hell. He loses. Don't believe Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar is a con artist. He claims to be a Christian motivational speaker. Hey, but he's actually Pinocchio. You know that, don't you? You've seen Pinocchio in that commercial. And Pinocchio is saying, all I can see is potential. And as soon as he says that, his nose starts growing. Well, that's what Zig Ziglar is. And that's what Tony Robbins is. And believe it or not... That's what Copeland and company and all those guys are. They are people who enchant and make people feel good. Anytime you're made to feel abnormally good above your normal state of mind and somebody's trying to wind you up when you were all depressed and down and out because you didn't have any money and you can't pay your bills and your cars broke down and your health is getting bad, they're going to say, all you have to do is be positive. There's not any difference between Tony Robbins and Kenneth Copeland. The only difference is Kenneth Copeland is doing this in the name of Jesus, and I despise him much more than I do Tony Robbins. I'll tell you, don't listen to Tony Robbins at all, because I've never met a Tony Robbins student that ever got rich. It's just not true. It's a way for those guys, they figured out how to make money. Don't you get it? It appeals to the flesh. It sure does. That's exactly what it does. And when people enchant you, they appeal to the flesh. The doctrine of the devil is a delusion because it appeals to the flesh. Doesn't it? Now, those of us that have been around for a long time, have you ever noticed the people that are fooled are real naive people? The people that are fooled are the people that are just not informed about the Bible and informed about life in general. And they believe this garbage. You have to learn anything that makes you feel accepted. Has anybody ever been in a situation somebody was making you feel great about who you were? Don't ever believe that. Never. And the, the so-called Christian community has gotten a hold of this and say, hey, we can make some money doing this. And they're taking scriptures and twisting them. They'll take the verse out of 3 John 2. I wish above all things thou mayest prosper and be in health. I brought that out more than any other verse because that is their favorite verse of the charismatic movement. The only problem is they don't ever go back to the Greek text and find out what prosper and health means. It's not our word prosper. It's not our word health. I've said it a thousand times. The word prosper is E-U-O-D-O-O. It is a construction of this is prosper. Prosper. And he said, I wish above all things. Now, do you actually believe that God is wishing above all things that you will prosper and have money? You think that's what he wants? I don't think so. The word prosper is you adao. It's constructed from E-U and hodos. Of course, there's no H's in the Greek. There's that H sound. It's the word you hodos. And when you put the two together, it's you adao. Well, you hodos, hodos is the common Greek word for way. It's the same word Jesus used when he said, I am the way. That's Jesus there in John 14 and 6. And you means well. We see that on our word eulogy, E-U-L-O-G-Y. A eulogy is when you stand at a funeral and you say, well, logos, over someone, well words. This word you means well or good way. Way is the word hodos, hodos. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the hodos. And he said, there's a narrow way and a broad way. There's a narrow hodos. That's the word in the Greek. And a broad hodos. So if John is wishing the well hodos, it has to be one of these two here. These are the only two ways. 
a narrow way that few find it, and a broad way that many go in thereat, and it leads to destruction. What John is wishing for guys is the narrow well way, which is Christ. And I'm looking into the camera, and you lying creatures, it has nothing to do with money. Woe to you that are rich. You have your consolation. How hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of God? And you go into the book of James, and James said, Do not rich men oppress you and take you before magistrates and take your money away? James was condemning the rich. And he says their riches are going to be a poison to them. There in the fifth chapter of, first of James. Now, and he says health, H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. Pugiano is the word health in 3 John 2. That's the same word as wholesome. Anyone who consents not to wholesome words, same words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in that sixth chapter of, of 1 Timothy, anyone who doesn't consent to wholesome words, Hugiano words, healthy words, uncorrupt words, this man is proud. He knows nothing. He's destitute of the truth. Huh? I can't. Oh, health. Okay. Anyone who consents not to corrupt, and it's the same word as sound in sound doctrine, doesn't have anything to do. I wish above all things that you have money and you have physical health. That's not what that's talking about. Now, what when you're talking about beguiling, you're talking about words, twisting words, and making them mean something they don't mean. This is exactly what men do when they take this Third John 2. And does that make me angry when they convince people to send their money to them because they see, they say, see, you're supposed to prosper and have lots of money and have physical health. That is beguiling. They're using guile. They're twisting words. They're using trickery. That's what the word guile, dolos, means. It means to speak by trickery. They are liars. Kenneth Copeland is a liar. Fred Price is a liar. T.D. Jakes and Benny Hinn are liars. Telling you that you can be rich like they are. That's If I suckered people, I could be rich like they are. It's the only way you can be rich like they are. God's God's people are the common people. The, did not Jesus say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor? He didn't say, And to the rich too. He says, To the poor, to the blind, those who can't see the truth, to the brokenhearted, to the bruised, to the crushed. That does not sound like the rich people in America. Doesn't. Paul say in 1 Corinthians, that first chapter, verse 26, not many mighty, not many wise in this world, not many noble are called. Who are the mighty and the wise in this world and the noble? They are the rich and the wealthy. Look what James says. Go over to the book of James. Go to James. It just astounds me that people will believe this. You can't take poor little widow ladies and Say, all you have to do is believe God and he'll make you rich. James condemns the rich all the way through this book. James. He kind of condemns the rich in the first chapter. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways in verse 8. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich. When he says, but the rich... He's put in a negative conjunction there that opposes what uh, opposes the previous verse. The low degree man, the poor man, the downtrodden, that man is going to be exalted, but the rich in that he is made low because as the fly of the grass, he shall pass away. And look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. Hearken, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you 
and draw you before judgment seats. That's what rich men do. They oppress you and draw you in. And he's talking about the first part of the chapter. He's saying, my brethren, in verse chapter, in chapter 2, verse 1, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now, usually when you respect persons, you're looking at the outward appearance, aren't you? Looking at the car, the house, the job, the clothes, the shark skin suit and the, and the alligator shoes. That's what people are looking at, and that's what they respect. That word respect, prosopletes, P-R-O-S-O-P-O, P-R-O-S-O, oplates. That's the word respect of persons. It comes from pros and ops. Ops is our word optical. It means the visage or what you see. The visage or what you see. What is seen? Pros means to lean toward or toward and lambano. Lambano means to take hold of what you, and then move toward what you see. It means the outward appearance. And did not the Lord say, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. The outward appearance is what sells people on a person if you wear fancy enough clothes and drive a fancy enough car, and if you have all the things that the world has to offer. Then he says, "Do not the, but ye have despised the poor, knowing that I didn't finish reading the earlier part. For if, if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in a poor man in vile raiment, just ragged, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say to him, sit here in the good place. We want you on the deacon's board. We want you on the finance committee. And say to the poor, stand over there and sit here under my footstool. You can't even have my footstool. You'll be my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves when you look up to the rich, to the man that looks good, he looks better than somebody else. God made us all what we are. Are you become, you are become judges of evil thoughts. That word partial is the word diacrino. Remember that word? Diacrino means to judge. You become the channel of judging by looking at the outward appearance. Diacrino uh, is, is used over in the first part of this chapter, in the first chapter, verse 6. Let a man ask in faith. He says, if a man lack wisdom while he's going through these fire and trials, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, verse 3 of chapter 1, but let patience have her perfect. Oh, by the way, that's the word teleos, if you were here on Sunday morning. Let patience have her perfect work. Referring back to verse 3, teleos means to mature you. It means maturity. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, teleos, and entire, not needing anything. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth of all men liberally. It don't mean ask for money. Ask for God to get you through the trials that you're going through in verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You're asking for God's help getting through the temptations. And God does not rebuke us on the idzo. He upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, death to self, nothing wavering, diacrino. When you ask of God, don't put your opinion in there. Diacrino means to discriminate and stick your opinion in there. Where's the word? Up here somewhere. Up on my left. Diacrino, right here. 
right there. So when he says over here, let him ask of nothing wavering, for if he wavereth, if he puts his opinion in, when you ask of God, say, God, give me what you know I need. Lord, I need a lot of help with my life. And quit putting your opinion in, but I think this is what God wants for me. Lord, help me. I was talking to several people this morning about losing their tempers when I said, get rid of your temper. Well, you don't say yes, but I have a right to lose my temper on this thing right here. You never have a right to lose your temper ever. Well, that's a hard place to come to, isn't it? Nobody has a right to ever lose their temper. If you do, God's got some more beating to do on you. Till you come to a place that I'm not losing. Nobody has lost their temper more than I have in my life. Nobody. Because I had too much of Harless Brown in me. I wasn't unreasonable like him, but I would lose my temper. I mean terribly. And I've come to a place I don't hardly ever lose it anymore. You know why? Because I'm so much smarter than you. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. The reason I don't is I'm old and tired of losing my temper. Got what? Got connections with God. Now, the thing is, I'm tired of it. If you lose your temper long enough, you'll get tired of doing it. See, it makes me physically ill. Did you know that? The older you get, the more you lose your temper, you get physically ill. I get physically ill. I don't do it anymore. I can't. I, me and Mary have our fusses. Do you know how long our fusses last? About that long. About two, min about two, about two inches. About what? <laughs> we don't do that anymore because it's a waste of time, isn't it? If you hadn't figured that out by now, if you're old and you hadn't figured it out, you better figure it out because it'll make you older faster. What? I'm still in James, the second chapter. 19 of what? Two. Thou believe it not. She wants me to read 19 of chapter 2. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The Deamonians believe also and tremble. What is the Deamonion? Itself. Kenneth Cope, let me put it this way. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Kenneth Copeland also believes and trembles. That's who it's talking about. It's talking about, it's talking about people who have deceived themselves into believing they believe God. The demons believe also and tremble. Then back over here, he says, you have dis uh, he says, if you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing... The flashy clothing, the shark skin suits, he says, and say to him, sit here in the good place, place but to the poor, sit up under my footstool. Are you not then, haven't you judged for yourself what's right and wrong by looking up to the money people and are become judges of evil thoughts? He says, it's an evil thing to look up to the rich and look down on the poor. And he's talking about the same thing when he's over here through the... When you get over here in the fourth chapter, he says, when From whence come wars and fightings among you, the church? Come they not even of your lusts, of your... of your... Uh, that war in your members? You lust... And have not you epithemio, epithemio, you lust. And who is you? Believers. Epi, T-H-U-M-E-O. Epi means to cover your life with hard breathing. I have got to have that car. And I've just got to have that woman. I've got to have that guy. I've got to have all that I want. You lust and have not, and you kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, 
You fight in war. You have not because you ask not. What? Does that mean you can ask God for anything you want? Remember the word ask, A-I-T-E-O? We receive the things that we ask if we keep his commandments. Keep commandments and do the things that are pleasing. What's pleasing to God is death to self. Death to self. In fact, that's what the Bible says in Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Die to self all the time as a believer. Don't live for yourself. Live for others. Do you know that keeps you out of trouble? Never angry. Well, I have a right to defend myself. No Christian ever has a right to defend themselves, ever. Jim, I, I, don't, I can't understand that. David said, Lord, you plead my cause. Plead, root, means to fight for me. I don't even know what to do anymore. At my age, I don't know how to... I don't know how to defend myself. Do I yell at someone? Do I scream and cuss at them? It's not Christian, is it? Do I lose my temper? No. The reason you never hear preachers preach this, people who watch me on TV think I'm angry for the wrong reason. They think I'm an angry man, and I am angry. The only thing I'm angry at are false teachers who cheat poor little widow ladies out of their money. Whenever I'm angry, I'm not angry at widow ladies. I'm over here hovering over the sheep. I've said this and used this illustration. Are your sheep okay? Is everybody all right? When I get out of the pulpit, I'm quiet. I'm gentle to everybody. I'm, and I'm over here saying, is everybody okay? You got a question? Okay, answer me. And some wolf comes up over here. I say, you get away from here. And some of the little sheep who are babies, they're going, oh, Jim's mad at us. No, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at somebody who's trying to cheat you and lie to you and steal from you. You understand that? Can people get a hold of that? I am angry at people by not feeling well. When we love you, she's, don't worry about it. She's not feeling good. But you have to come to a place of realizing Anytime somebody is angry, and you're supposed to be angry at false teachers, the Bible says, be angry, and the context is the winds of doctrine in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, be angry and sin not. When you sin, it's when you're angry at people that have done you wrong. But when you're angry at the winds of doctrine that cheat widow ladies out of their money, that's right. You're not supposed to... Well, Kenneth Copeland talks about some sort of a Jesus. He preaches another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. He's not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible says death to self, daily cross, self-denial, and suffer for righteousness' sake and allow men to do these things to you and let God fight, do your fighting for you. I don't believe, any, I don't believe a believer, if you ever come to maturity... You're going to come to the place where you're going to say, if my king, if Jesus' kingdom were of this world, then would his servants fight. And you're not supposed to ever be arguing and fighting with anyone. Well, am I supposed to be a pansy? No, you stand up and say, here's the truth. And if they want to persecute, it for, persecute you for it, look at them like Jesus did. And as a lamb to slaughter as a sheep before his shears is done, open not your mouth. Tell them the truth and let the Word of God do the damage it wants to do. Get that, con that temper under control. I had, I had one man come to me this morning and said, Oh, man, dealing with some things is hard for me to deal with. I said, But you have to learn that's what God wants in our lives. Did you know that if I say this, I know a lot of people have a hard time believing it, I don't get mad anymore. And I used to get mad four or five times a day. And do you know that my life is easier? If somebody wants to argue, I say, okay. I have learned somebody with their mind set, I'm not going to give them facts and turn their head around. 
The only way you're going to turn anybody's head is by a godly, Christ-like example. That's the only way you're going to ever influence anyone. You cannot influence them by insisting you have your way and you're not going to treat me like that. It's going to start tearing your insides up and your heart and your guts and your asthma and your bronchitis. Stress aggravates every disease. Every disease. I am absolutely positive of that. It's aggravated all my diseases I've had through the years. Now, I just say if they want to feel that way, and I don't even, whenever I've come to the place of realizing that people are the way they are, I don't even resent it in my mind because I know they haven't developed enough yet to learn better than what they're doing. And they're the ones that's suffering. So I don't try to put any more on it by insisting that they see things my way. I'll say, you don't need to be doing that. And you cannot change men and turn them around. Only thing you can do is say, you're going to be miserable as long as you keep that opinion. As long as you approach the world that way. Do you know that about half this ministry does that? Maybe three quarters of it does that. All you're doing is hurting yourself. That's it. That's all a man does, he hurts himself. Now, if you'll notice what he says over here, and he says, if you respect these rich men, notice he mentioned, he mentioned from 1 through 4 about respecting persons, and then he talks about the rich oppressing the poor down here through verse 6. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. Isn't that what rich men do? That's what he said. And then he says, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, he talked about respecting persons up in the first verse. And it, here's what he does. From one through four, one through four, he's talking about respecting persons prosopotes looking at something motioning towards it and taking hold of it because what it looks like on the exterior but God looks at the heart he doesn't look at the outward appearance so one through four he's talking about respecting persons and then he goes into who those persons are you respect Starting in verse 5, he goes on down through verse 7, and he's talking about 5 through 7. He's telling you these persons that men respect are the rich. That's what he's saying. And then he says, in verse 9, he takes you back to respecting persons. If you respect persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And if you'll notice, 9 through 11 go together. 9 through 11. And watch what he does. He describes what these, what uh, men that respect persons, what's going to happen. He says, but if you respect persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. If you look at the outward appearance of a rich man and what he's got and what you think he is, he says, you commit sin and are convinced the law is transgressors, but whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. And he's saying, you can keep all the law and you can respect persons and you're guilty of the entire law. Breaking all of it. And then, you've heard me say this, but let me explain this. The whole context here is respecting the rich, isn't it? That's what it's talking about. And then he says, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, what's the context of all this? Respecting persons, looking up to the rich. And then he starts equating killing and adultery he is equating this along with respecting persons. He said, if you look up to the rich, 
It's as bad as killing and committing adultery. Who? For he that said, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. He's saying here that respect of persons is classified along with adultery. I've said this, never explained it. Murder and respect persons and look at the outward appearance because you have a tendency to let that man off the hook and continue in his adultery and murder. So if you respect persons, you're contributing to the man that's committing adultery and murder. And that's what the rich do. And when you go over here to chapter 3, he's talking about not going out here in the world and not wanting to get rich. You're deceived if you do that. He says over here in chapter, well, he goes down here and he says, you ask amiss, you adulterers and adulteresses. There in verse 4, chapter 4. Verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about literal adultery. He's talking about lusting after the things of the world, money and things and stuff. It can be women and men, but he said it's wanting to go after the world. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God, and whosoever be a friend of the world is is whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Enmity, of course, is the word ekthra, hostile. He's saying, if you're friends with the rich in the world and you're letting down your convictions, you're God's enemy. Well, he goes all through here, and he's saying, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves under the sight of God, in verse 10, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself. Don't run with the world, with the rich. And then he goes on to say, Come now, in verse 13, or go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go in such a city and continue there, and buy and sell and get gain. Notice what all this is about. It's about making money, isn't it? He's saying, don't say, I'm going to go make all this money. He says, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor. You know what's going to happen tomorrow. That appeareth for a little time, and then it's gone. It vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we will live and do this or that. If it's God's will. But now you rejoice in your boastings, and he is talking about, the believer talking about how much money he's going to make, that is A-L-A-Z-O-N. Alazon, it comes from Alazonyai. It means self-confidence or self-esteem. You're esteeming yourself when you go after the money people. And remember, the doctrine of the devil is distributing fortunes, isn't it? Then he says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. And the context of knowing to do good is not talking about yourself and saying, I'm going to go make lots of money and I learned this attitude from these rich people. And then he says in chapter 5, go to now ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that come upon you. You're ri He's still talking about rich people and what they do to the poor, isn't he? Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were, were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. And when he gets up here into verse 10, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Suffering affliction is the word kakopathia. Pathos, evil. And the whole context of this chapter 
is about suffering at the hands of evil, rich men. That's what it's talking about. So, whenever you're talking about distributing forces, Jim, shouldn't I make a good living? Yes, but you shouldn't decorate yourself with the finest uh, Cadillac and and work your brains out to get a big uh, estate on the lake. And, and your life shouldn't be about you. It should be about others. That's what it's supposed to be about. Now, this is going to kind of lead us into, we've been going through these words here. What is it that deceives a man? Well, money's the big thing. If a man has the money, he'll have the women and the sex and the power. He'll have the glory, won't he? There's no man that's ever got real rich. He doesn't have all the rest of this that he wants. All you do is have to have the money, and it'll buy everything, won't it? An old man can buy a young woman if he's gotten enough money. And his money can do that. These guys in Hollywood, like Clint Eastwood, and I saw he's worth $300 million. He can, and he's 84 years old. He can have any of those young girls out there in Hollywood he wants because he used to be Mr. Handsome, and now he's a tall old man. That's what he is, just an old man. He ain't young and handsome no more. But he can have him because he's got $300 million. And when you got billions like some of these got, they, these guys, they can have what they want. Now, this we've been talking about this word, this word, apatao, and we went through the verses on it, Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you there in 5 and 6. And in 1 Timothy 2 and 14, Adam was not deceived but the woman. And then James 1, 26 a man that does not bridle his tongue, he's deceived. If you don't get control of your tongue, what would that be? That would be everything you can think of. Cussing, getting angry, yelling, screaming, bragging, boasting. You know that all the trouble a man has, just about 100% of it is with his tongue. If you hear somebody bragging and boasting all the time, that makes you sick. You don't want to be around them. You hear them cussing all the time, that makes you sick and you don't want to be around them. If you hear them fighting all the time, you, that makes you sick and you don't want to be around them, right? People don't want to be around that. So if you don't want people to feel that about you, change. Bridle your tongue. If it's all about you and not... You know, I've found out this as I've gotten older. When I get around people, I talk about them. I talk about their problems. I get my mind off of my problems. And when you're going to be a pastor of a group like this, you've got to talk about people's problems and what they're going through. And you begin to find out how much more easy life is when you talk about others and you're trying to lift them up because when you're talking about yourself and they're talking about themselves, it's a wrestling match on who gets in the last word, isn't it? You ever been around somebody and you're wanting to talk about you and they're wanting to talk about them? Yeah, build up. It's tearing them down and they're tearing you down. And you walk away from that conversation resenting each other. Isn't that true? Now, let me get me a drink of water. All right. I want us to go back where we were last week, and it fits in with what we've been talking about, about distributing fortunes. What deceives the man? Let's go back to Matthew 13. We've gone through apatao, ap, and we're going through apate. And here's the word, apate. Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. And I've said that you find the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and you need to read all of it. Matthew 13 and Mark 4. Let me erase this over here. Oh, 
All right. When you're studying one of the Gospels, Matthew 13, this is the parable of the sower. If you have a Thompson Chain Bible, it will have in the margin where you find the other chapters. It'll have Mark 4 and Luke 8. These are the parallel chapters in the Synoptic Gospels on the parable of the sower right here. So you need to read all of them. If you're going to study that way, that's the way you need to study. Now back to Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. We see four seeds being sown here. Four seeds. Let me, what did I do with my paper here? All right. This is the parable of the sower. Now, where have I put my... Y'all have to excuse me for a minute. I'll do this from time to time. All right. Now, Matthew 13, we're talking about the parable of the sower. Now, the first time the word apate is mentioned is in verse 22. We've gone through the first seed... A man goes out to sow the seed. This is the sower. Verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Well, when you go over here, later in the chapter, Jesus explains what he's talking about. Uh, Jesus said to the multitude, He sent the multitude away in verse 36, and went into the house, and the disciples came, saying, Declare to us the parable of the tares and of the field. And he answered and said, He that soweth, the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus, sowing it into our hearts. This is predestination because you don't sow the seed into your own heart and make yourself come alive, and you don't make yourself good ground. He makes you good ground, then he sows the seed, and as the husbandman or the sower, he tills the soil, and he puts you through all the necessary things you have to go through in order for the seed to grow. And he says, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the tares are the children of the wicked, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. That's very simple. So when you go back here, he says, uh, hear the parable of the sower. And he, we talked about the first seed. It, doesn't, it falls on stony ground. It has no root, and the root out of dry ground is Christ. Verse 22, he says, he also that receives seed among thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world. He likes the world too much. And the deceitfulness, this is the first time the word apate, A-P-A-T-E, is mentioned in the Gospels or in the New Testament. The deceitfulness of riches chokes the word. A man is deceived when he thinks riches is going to make him happy in the word. That word is the word apate or delusion. The deceitfulness, what deceives a man is when he thinks if he makes a lot of money, he'll get happy. The only way you can be happy as a believer is committing your life to God and accepting what he brings to your life and in everything give thanks. Now, he says, the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word, chokes, sum penigo, means to wheeze, or wheeze down, sum, P-N-I-G-O, sum penigo, means to wheeze. The fact that there's a wheezing going on, and the fact, if you'll notice what he says, it chokes the word, and the man becomes unfruitful. He hasn't always been unfruitful, but when a believer seeks after riches, I have done this. I have sought to try to be rich in my life. I tried to get rich in real estate. 
I wanted to be rich in the music world. And that's everything a believer is not supposed to be doing. It choked the word in my life. It caused me not to bear any fruit through most of my 30s while I was out there in the world. The more you live in the Lord and live in Christ, the more you're going to understand this. Now, I want to give you some things on the deceitfulness of riches. Let me read some of these verses to you. The Bible says that the reason Israel began to fall away from God in Ezra, the ninth chapter, is they sought the peace and the wealth of the pagans. They wanted to get along with the pagans, and they wanted to have peace with them, so they intermarried with their daughters. When you intermarry with the world, it don't mean you go out and marry a woman in the world. You just intermarry your life, and you run with the world, and you can't do that. Look over here in... And uh, I want us to go to Psalms, the 49th chapter. Go to Psalms 49. We're going to read a few verses on wealth. And this is a deceitfulness. Psalms 49. Psalms 49 and verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Regardless of how much money you have, you're not going to be able to redeem a man out of sin. You can't buy him out of it. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever that he shall still live forever and not see corruption. Now, look over here in, look over here in Psalms 112. Well, let me read verse 10 there. For he that seeth, where, I read 6. For he that seeth that wise men die Likewise, likewise, the fool and the stupid Persian perish. The word stu- brutish is stupid, ba'ar, and leave their wealth to others. Everybody's going to die and leave their wealth. That includes Bill Gates. That includes all these Rupert Murdoch. That includes uh, all these rich people that are super rich in America. Their inward thought is, now this is the way the rich people think, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. Washington, D.C., Columbus, Ohio, Nashville, Tennessee, These are all last names. Hendersonville, Tennessee. Where I was raised, Fort Worth, Texas, named after a man named Worth who was a commander down there. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. All your riches is not going to make you abide. He is like the beasts that perish. Everybody that's rich is not going to be rich one day. When I was young, in my 30s, in my 20s, I read J. Paul Getty's biography. J. Paul Getty was the richest man in America in the 60s, but who knows who he is now? Nobody. Nobody even cares about J. Paul Getty. J. Paul Getty had one of the most sad lives of anybody I ever read after. He was miserable. His kids were all drunks or drugs or alcoholics of some kind. And even his granddaughter said when she was 18 and she inherited her share of all that billions that J. Paul Getty was worth, she said she was going to commit suicide because she saw what it did to her uncles and aunts and to her father. Well, good luck. 
Then go over here to Psalms 112. Psalms 112. Just like to give you some of these verses on money. Psalms 112. Now this is a verse that the Charismatics use to say, See, you get lots of money. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. We're talking a man that, a man that fears God and blesses God. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Well, you don't ever hear the Charismatics read those two verses. They read the third verse. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. But they don't say that this is the blessed man that fears God and delights in God's commandments. And then when they use the word wealth, they say that means money, lots of money, lots of wealth. Well, this word here, wealth, is the word H-O-W-N, H-O-W-N. It means enough. There'll be enough there. And to the ancient world, enough meant they had a donkey, they had a house made out of some cheap material with a dirt floor, and they had a fig tree outside, and this was called wealth in the ancient world. It's not a hey, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. That's not what it's talking about. Wealth and riches, oh sure, accumulation. But to them, to accumulate, O-S-H-E-R, did not mean millions of dollars because those people didn't have that. That meant to have two donkeys and two fig trees. That's what enough meant to them, and that's what riches meant to the ancient world. Shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Now, let's look over here. See, they what they do, they take the English word, and that actually misleads. It's beguiling. English is beguiling. It doesn't mean what they say it means. And look over here in... Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs 13. Well, let me let me go to Proverbs before we go there. Let's go to Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10 and verse 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. His wealth is all he has to rely upon. They considered a strong city, a city with walls about it, and they had towers on the end of the city. And if you had high walls, that was your strength. What it's saying here is a rich man's wealth is his strength. And if the bank goes bankrupt, or if you have a recession or a depression, he's going down. That's what this is saying here. Rich man's wealth is his strong city. What verse was I in? 5 and 10? 15. Oh, 15. Oh, 10 and 15. 10 and 15. It's his strong city, the labor of the righteous to tender to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. He is the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof errs. He is the man that's deceived. Now look here in, in Proverbs... 13, Proverbs 13, and verse 11. I want to show you what the Bible says about the rich and the poor. And distributing fortunes is the doctrine of the devil. Proverbs 13 and verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. The man who uses worthless means to get wealth, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. He's saying vanity is not by labor. It's the word hebo. It means worthlessness. You've cheated somebody. You've deceived them. But if you work for your money, he said that's an honorable man. Look down here in verse 22. 
A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. What in the world does that mean? That word wealth is the word kail, C-H-A-Y-I-L. It's the common word valor, virtue. Even it's the word army. And we are God's army and we're in a fight against sin. This is a word that's very seldom translated in, into any word that means literal wealth. It's a word that means a man who is it's going to be laid up for the just, for the good, for the righteous. The word is sadiq. It means for the righteous. It's not talking about money. It's talking about spiritual wealth, which would be in the army of God. I've got a, a paper, and I've wrote all of these I did a copy of the paper on all the times this word is mentioned in the Bible, and usually it's the word army or valor or virtue, or it has to do with having spiritual strength. Now, look over here in in chapter Proverbs 19. Now, this is what happens. This goes back to James the second chapter. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. This would be a synonymous chapter, chapter 19, starting in verse 1. This would be a synonymous chapter, or these words are about to be said, along with James 2. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. The man who twists, that word he kisheth, distorts words. A man who distorts words is filled with guile. He's beguiling people and leading them away. Also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good, and he that hasteneth with his feet sinneth. You hurry to do sin. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Wealth maketh many friends, doesn't it? People like the rich. Oh, that's have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons, isn't it? Isn't this the same thing, saying the rich get, have many friends? But the poor is separated from his neighbor. We don't have the poor people and those downtrodden people and those poor and brokenhearted and bruised. We don't like those Christians, and I use that term in its true sense. I'm not using it loosely. All right, what verse was I in? A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape the wrath of God. You can stick that in there if you want to. Now, look over here in Ecclesiastes 5. I want you to see some of these. Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter and verse 19. Fifth chapter, verse 19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth. Now, when they used the word riches and wealth back then, they did not mean filthy rich. Like I said, they meant having a donkey and having a, maybe a camel. And uh, you want to get rich, buy you a camel, buy a donkey, and plant a fig tree out behind your house. We've already got the fig tree. All we need is a donkey and a camel. And hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. He's saying, when you have the things that are necessary. He's not talking about filthy rich. That's not what the word rich and wealth meant over there in the Old Testament because God condemns that when you're not helping others. Now, let me give you a couple of verses on the rich. On the rich. Go back here. Now, we're talking about 
the rich oppressing the poor. And those who distribute fortunes to themselves, when they distribute the money to themselves, I have worked with many rich people in my life. I've never met anybody that's real rich that had any principle. I've met a lot of them that were real nice. When they talked, you thought you could trust them. They talked in a real gentle, quiet voice. And then they would cheat you, I mean, stick it to you in a deal and just twist the blade when they stuck it in. I have been there in real estate. I've been there in music world. Men will do anything for money. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's, if you have money, if you have enough money, you have everything else that life has to offer. All you got to do is be real rich and all the world will grovel around you, bowing down to you, and all the women will want you because of your money, and all the men will want you because of your money. That's what entices people. Money answers all questions in life. Money fulfills the flesh. When you get behind all these guys that are wealthy, when you look at a politician, a lot of people don't know this, but a politician goes to Washington, and I don't know what they're making, 100000 a year for a senator or something like that, the president makes two hundred or three hundred or four hundred, about four hundred thousand a year, but that's not all he makes. When a person retires from Congress or retires from being a senator, they start getting all of these people back in their hometowns to want them to put their approval on some building project or some project to build this building downtown. And as long as they've got that man's name, who is a very famous senator and he's just retired and he's gone back home, his name buys all the respect necessary to, to uh, build anything he wants to build. And sometimes they'll go to a senator or to a, an ex-president and they will give them 15, 20% just to stick their name on something. And then they will do, then they will if they've been a famous senator, they'll book themselves into colleges for $50,000 a night to speak in colleges and universities. They do this. So if you become a super senator, like Howard Baker that retired here in Nashville, he was the Senate Majority Leader. When you have a name that big, or Strom Thurmond, or, or the Kennedys, when they were senators, they could go anywhere and demand a minimum of 50000 a night to speak, and they could have 200 nights a year. That's a lot of money. He gets a lot of money. And when you do that, 50000 is a small amount. They can get a hundred, two hundred thousand 200000 for one night. Of course, when you go in there, you've got to pay $1,000 a throw, at a per person to get in there to be able to listen to him, and I don't know why. I wouldn't give him fifty. I wouldn't give him five dollars to get in to listen to him. But that's the wealth has many. The wealthy has many friends because they pull the strings of the world. Now, let me give you some things on the rich. Look at Job thirty-four. We're talking about men who respect persons, men who respect the wealthy and the rich. Job 34. Job at one time was very rich, and he lost it all. Now here's what Job says about the Lord. Job 34. And look here in verse... Let's read down to the verse I want. Look at verse 12, and we're going to read a few verses here. Yea, surely, this is Elihu, the young preacher, talking to Job and his friends. Yea, surely, God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. 
And Job's friends were saying, you must have done something wrong to have lost all your children and lost all your substance. Substance. Who hath given him a charge over the earth, or who hath disposed the whole world? Who's done this besides God? If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto the dust. If now thou hast understanding, hear this. Hearken to the voice of my words, Elihu says. Elihu's a young preacher. You can tell this is Elihu. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said in verse 1, Shall even he that hateth right govern? And wilt thou condemn him that is most just? Is it fit to say to a king, Thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they all are the work of his hands. God doesn't regard the rich. If you think being rich is going to get you somewhere with God when you get to the judgment, well, you're wrong, Bill Gates. And the other rich guys in this nation. And then look over here in... God doesn't, he doesn't regard the rich at all. God looks at the heart of man, and who fixes the heart? He does. Huh? Okay. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away. The mighty shall be taken away without any assistance, without hand. The mighty are going to be destroyed. Not many mighty not many wise in this world, not many noble are called. Don't worry about being poor. Don't worry about having little. The point is, everybody has what they're supposed to have, and everybody is where they're supposed to be. But you're not supposed to sit there and be happy. or You can be content, but you're not to be satisfied with your situation, go forward. You're supposed to advance forward spiritually. Okay. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. And that's the rich. For he will not lay upon man more than right that he should enter into judgment without God, with God. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number and set others in their stead. Hmm. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? All right. Look over here in Proverbs. In Proverbs uh, 13. Proverbs 13. Go back over there. I think we need to read these things. 13 and verse 7. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There's a man that's made himself rich and he doesn't have anything. When these rich people die, they leave it all to their family and friends and children who spend it as fast as they can. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. That's what life is about when we are rich in the Lord. Look at 14 and 20. 14 and verse 20. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. The rich hath lots of friends because they've got money. Money buys people. Did you know that? I mean, you remember all those gangsters? I, it was said that Al Capone had Chicago in his pocket because he had the judges. He had the police. He did what he wanted to do. They couldn't get him. They never could get Al Capone for murdering all the people and ordering all the murders of the people that he murdered in Chicago. So they finally got him on income tax evasion. That's all they could get on him. And he killed a lot of people. And do you know that Chicago loved him? 
They loved him. He's always helping the poor and giving to the poor, and he was killing people to do it. But he didn't make the poor rich. Look at 18, verse 11. 18. 18. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. This is said several times in Proverbs, and as a high wall in his own conceit. The only thing that will save a rich man is his conceit, and that lasts till he dies, and that's it. It's over. Look at verse 23 of this chapter. The poor uses entreaties or gentleness, but the rich answer, answereth roughly. And that's what the rich do. They command and demand people. I, I read, I saw this article, and it said that Sylvester Stallone, he's probably worth uh, half a billion dollars at least, 500 million probably. And I saw that they had these domestics that work for these people in Hollywood, and one of them said he worked for Stallone, and he said, Sylvester Stallone would not allow you to look him in the eye. If you looked him in the eye, he would fire you. You had to be humble and keep your head down at all times. Did you know that Kenneth Copeland will not allow people in his factories? He's got these printing factories where he prints all of his material to send things out. He's got several hundred people working for him. He will not allow anyone to look up and say his name or say, Hello, Brother Copeland. He doesn't want he doesn't want you taking any time out. He wants all the work he can get out of you. If you if he walks in there. Won't allow that. It's just these people are ungodly and arrogant. Look at Proverbs twenty one. Proverbs I'm just giving you a few of these things on the rich. Twenty one. And look here at verse 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. He's talking about the rich who want all the goodies of life. That's not the rich man. The man that's rich, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressor for the upright. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with, than with a contentious and angry woman. I thought I'd read that. <laughs> Which other one? 18 verse, 18 verse 22, okay. 18 verse 22. Whoso findeth the wife findeth the good thing and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. But it's not talking about the contentious wife. All right. Look here in 22. Look at look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, and look here in, in verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. If a man is rich, God made him rich. It don't just mean it doesn't just mean God's the maker of their physical bodies. He made them rich or he made them poor. And look here in look here in Proverbs verse 7 here. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Look here in 22 and 16. 16. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. You're going to come to a place where you're going to be in need, and the need you're going to have is at the judgment, and you're going to say, I am poor and needy, and I don't have any Savior, and I have nothing to deliver me. Look here in, in Proverbs 23. You see, Proverbs has much to say about this. Proverbs 23 and verse 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Labor, it doesn't say labor not. It says labor not to be rich. Labor hard. Do good, honorable, honest work. And if you do make a lot of money and you're very, you have business acumen, then support the ministry, support the needy, support the missionaries. 
Do the things that you're supposed to do. Huh? 23, 5. 23. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Riches do fly away. And you know how God will cause that to happen? He caused it to happen to me. I got real sick. I, I was in real estate and I was going like a... Working like a Turk, as the old saying goes. Working 90, 95 hours a week. Making good money. I ended up getting real sick in my mid-40s, going to the hospital over a two-year period, and all my clients flew away. Just flew away into the heavens, just in the distance. And God put a straw on my IRAs in the bank and sucked it out. And I... And Ended up in the hospital. When I got out of the hospital, I couldn't work. And Mary said, what are you going to do? I said, I'll do what I can. I know that I'm going to have a class in the den here. And I know I'm going to try to serve the Lord from now on. And I hadn't been serving the Lord. I'd been serving me. And God will suck all of your investments out. He'll destroy you to get your attention. That's what he'll do. He's done that to me. He'll take everything a man's got and say, do I have your attention now? And sometimes it takes God a long time to do that, but he'll do it. Look here in Proverbs 28. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 6. 28, verse 6. And I think it's good that we read these verses on the wealth and the rich and how God looks upon it. 28, verse 6. Better is the poor that walketh in uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Distributing fortunes, God doesn't have a whole lot of good things to say about the rich. How hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven? It's not, it's going to be hard, but you might be rich in your own pride now, that goes along with wanting to fight God and fight uh, status quo, wanting to fight things, and you're rich in pride. If a man is rich in that, a rich in himself, if he's rich in his pride, he will not repent easily. God has to break that. I believe it goes along with being rich in money. It's a man that's rich in self. Some people have, some people down here on Broad Street, downtown Nashville, they're rich in pride. They think they outdrink all the other bums on the street, and they can. And that's that's wealth. How much time do I have, Mike? Six. Let me read a couple of more of these. Twenty eight eleven. Did I read that? Twenty eight eleven. The rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding will search him out and find him out eventually. And he won't keep him fooled very long if a man is a man is emptied of self. He'll find him out. And look down here in verse 20. Look at verse 20. Huh? 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And look here in verse 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that hasteneth to be rich shall not be innocent. A man that puts everything he's got into being rich is not innocent. To have respect of persons is not good, verse 21, for for a piece of bread that man will transgress. What he's saying, for the smallest thing a man will transgress. The man who's a liar and hastens to be rich, he'll try to beat your socks off just for the smallest thing, just for a few dollars. He that hastens to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. He, and I love verse 23, He that rebuketh the man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. The man that's flattering with the tongue is the man that's trying to be rich. He's saying smooth things. That's what Copeland and company does. So he says, 
after it's all over with, when you rebuke somebody, you're going to have more favor than the man that made you feel good up front. And then, I gave you 22 there. He's talking about the same man in verse 24. Whoso robbeth his father or mother and saith, it is no transgression, the same is the companion of a destroyer. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, and he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. It doesn't mean cellulite. It means the richest of, the richest of spiritual things. And then when you look at Ecclesiastes 5, look at Ecclesiastes 5. Now we're talking about what deceives a man. The deceitfulness of riches chokes the word, doesn't it? The deceitfulness of riches chokes the word and is unfruitful. The, he's talking about the, to the believer when you're deceived by thinking, if I can just get rich and make lots of money and have my house paid for and have everything paid for while I'm still young, oh, you'll eventually get your house paid for. I got my house paid for, but guess what happened? <laughs> Insurance went up through the roof. When you have heart trouble and Mary's got high blood pressure, at one point she retired from Kroger's and we had to keep her Blue Cross and she had to go with Blue Cross Cobra, and it was $1,000 a month for her insurance. Well, we couldn't let it go just to insure her. And at that time, mine was 500 So we got our $500 a month house note paid off, and then our insurance is 1500 What was Obama doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not that now. Because we got Medicare. But believe it or not, my Medicare is over 300 a month for me, and it comes out of my retirement. Nothing's free in life. Hadn't you figured that out? And I, you figure out what we pay for Medicare, my Blue Cross supplement. She's got Blue Cross supplement and Medicare. We're, I hadn't even stopped and figured it up. It's probably six or 700 a month. But I got my house paid for. <laughs> I better have my house paid for with insurance that costs that, right? And you think, boy, when I ever get my house paid for, if I could do that while I was young, no. Whatever you're going to say, no. Because when you get old, you got all these other expenses. And when you get our age, when you get in your late 50s, you've got to have insurance because anything can happen anytime now if you don't own nothing you're you can just declare bankruptcy but if you own anything to protect it you've got to have insurance you can go to the hospital when i went to the hospital for my heart attack they cut my chest open threw my heart around the room bounced it. that's what it felt like when i was coming out of it just to cut my chest open saw that open pull it back, and do triple bypass, just the surgeon's fee was $100,000. That's just the surgeon. That's not the time in the hospital, the medication, everything else. About 250000 altogether. Would that have broke me? Well, yeah. Yeah. And then I'd have to go buy a house or rent and pay 800 a month for a little two-bedroom apartment. Uh there's no way to win in America. Did you know that? Forget it. <laughs> Is there? And uh, I don't even know what my cancer operation cost. I don't even know what Mary's operations have cost. And we've been in the, out of the hospital so many times I should own shares in it over here. We've, we've had every kind of problems you can have. Mary's been under treatment to uh, hypertension doctors for a long time. And they rate her higher than me. And I'm the guy that had the heart attack and the heart surgery, but they rate her higher with her blood pressure than me, the insurance companies do. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm through here. 
Maybe this will help you to see whenever the Bible's talking about the cares of life. It's not in money. That's not where happiness is. There was a time I was making really good money, and I thought, I'm going to get rich. I'm going to open up the world to myself and have so much money, I ain't going to have to worry about nothing. The older you get, you don't have to worry about anything because you're going to be dead soon. (laughs) And the best thing to do is let it happen. It's going to happen. I keep saying this. If your life is destroyed, you end up with nothing, and all you've got is a tree out here and a rock to sit on, and that's all you've got. Sit down under the, sit on the rock and say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? And quit stressing out because we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to be arguing, fighting. There's nothing Christ-like about any of this. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you're not rich, riches make, it messes your head up. Did you know that? messes your mind up the more money you got the more messed up you are look at those guys out there in hollywood they they can't handle a wife for over six or eight weeks and then they divorce and marry another one i think they're all nuts you know what they are let's pray father thank you for truth help us to realize lord that it's not the things of this life that make us content it's it's you it's truth Deal with our hearts. Crush us under your hand because you said you came to the crushed, the bruised. Help get our minds off of this world. Cause us to look forward to coming to be with you. That's where we have peace, Lord. Lead us to your elect family. We praise you all things in Christ's name. Amen.